Although they may not be as famous as the Disney princess couples nor the Pixar couples, there are still plenty of great love stories to be found within DreamWorks animation. That being said, there are also a few couples that could use some work and maybe shouldn't have even gotten together at all. But which couples are healthy and which are toxic? I'm Kifinosi with Wicked Binge and this is DreamWorks Animation Couples, Healthy to Toxic. As always, we're going to be starting off with the healthiest and sweetest couples before working our way down. These couples are the healthy. Our gold medal of healthiness is going to Hiccup and Astrid from the How to Train Your Dragon series. Having the duration of three films and a television show to grow, develop, and change for the better, this couple is a pretty iconic one. We will say, however, that they didn't exactly start on the right foot. Hiccup was a pretty awkward guy, often accidentally causing trouble, which made Astrid look down on him. Is this some kind of a joke to you? And then things became more tense once they began taking dragon training classes together, with Astrid getting a bit jealous of Hiccup's growing success. Eventually, though, their relationship starts to bloom after the romantic flight on Toothless, and things just continue to blossom from there. These two end up becoming a total power couple in the later movies, always having each other's backs. Astrid also becomes more encouraging and supportive, while Hiccup is protective while still allowing Astrid to fight for herself. We also get a lot of cute couple banter scenes between them, making the punches on the arm that Astrid sometimes gives Hiccup more playful than hurtful. Hiccup still admires her for being so strong and skilled, while Astrid has complete trust in Hiccup even when others think his plans are crazy. At the end of the third film, we see that these two actually do end up getting married and have two kids, showing that even after all these years, their relationship is still just as strong and loving as ever. The silver medal of healthiness is going to Madagascar's Gloria and Melman. Talk about a bit of an odd couple. DreamWorks has a lot of these, actually. But out of all of them, we feel that Gloria and Melman's relationship may just be the best. The first Madagascar film doesn't hint at anything too romantic between them, instead showing their camaraderie as friends. Once we get into the second film, though, things start to become a bit more interesting. I love you, Gloria! I always have! Although he's a little jealous of Gloria's relationship with Moto Moto at first, Melman doesn't try to fight for her initially. Instead, he tells Moto Moto to treat Gloria right showing in the moment how much he cares about her. Later on in the film, we see Melman being willing to sacrifice himself in order to try and get Gloria and the rest of the animals on the reserve some water. Gloria saves him from his lava demise and the two begin dating. Though they don't get quite as much to do in the third film, we do see Gloria encouraging Melman as she shows him how to dance with the partner, and the two of them end up putting on a pretty amazing tight wire routine. These two clearly care about each other a ton, always looking out for each other and showing each other plenty of affection. Like we said, just incredibly sweet. Moving on, we're giving the bronze medal of healthiness to our most recent DreamWorks couple, Mr. Wolf and Diane Foxington. While their romance is pretty subtle and there's no big kiss or anything like that, we felt that these two still deserve to be on the list, if only because of all the flirting that they do through their banter. They don't start out on the best foot, with Diane looking down on Wolf and his gang and Wolf wanting to get back at her for all of her insults, hoping to humiliate her by stealing the golden dolphin. Once Wolf discovers their similar backgrounds, however, they start to form a really strong connection. Diane not only supports and encourages Wolf when it comes to him going good, but she also ends up helping him and his gang immensely. She frees them from jail and was willing to reveal her identity as the Crimson Paw for their sake. Wolf, in return, has a lot of respect and admiration for Diane, not wanting to break her trust in him. For all the petty insults and small jabs, it's all done in a playful manner. These two just have a really great dynamic, and it was awesome seeing them become a power couple of sorts by the end of the film. Next, we have Guy and Eep. Although they have a ton of differences between them, this is another DreamWorks pair where opposites really do attract. While Eep is more physical and can be aggressive, it doesn't take long for her to fall for Guy, who is inventive, helpful, and shares her curiosity. He, for the most part, doesn't look down on Eep for being a Neanderthal. In fact, Guy is usually endeared by her cave person tendencies. The two are pretty supportive of each other, with Eep usually being the first one to support Guy's inventions, even when the rest of her family doesn't understand them. They also have some pretty adorable moments together, like their scene with the flowers in the first film, or when Guy shares his umbrella with her in the second movie. Although they may argue a bit more, the two of them don't hold a grudge and properly apologize, acknowledging their own mistakes. Guy also calls Eep the only woman he loves. Aww. Following them, we have the unconventional couple Barry Benson and Vanessa. Although they don't officially date in B-Movie, mostly acting as friends and business partners, Barry's crush still plays a major part in their relationship, so we're counting it. 
Like the best couples on this list, there's a ton of support and respect between them. Even if Vanessa freaks out a bit when first discovering that Barry can talk, I mean, who wouldn't? He's a bee. Vanessa is there for Barry every step of the way during his lawsuit and then during their pollination plan. Although Barry is originally attracted to Vanessa's kindness and beauty, he still respects her as her own person and doesn't try to get between her and Ken on purpose to spite his crush. I'm helping him sue the human race. Really, the only thing that could bring their rating down somewhat, other than the obvious uh, biological differences, is the brief argument and slap fight they have while flying the plane, but even that is meant to be more of a comedic moment than anything actually hurtful or concerning. Next up we have Principal Krupp and Lunch Lady Edith. This romantic subplot in the Captain Underpants movie is admittedly a bit of an underbaked one, but it still has its sweet moments. While Krupp is normally seen as a grumpy and lonely school principal, his interactions with Edith usually end up showing his softer side due to his crush on her. Krupp also doesn't look down on Edith for her shyness nor her occasional weirdness. Edith, meanwhile, is not only an incredibly kind person, but also accepts Krupp for who he is. Both sides of him, in fact. Instead of being disgusted at the end of the film when he becomes Captain Underpants during their date, Edith just goes along with it. I have never been to such a fancy restaurant before. We can't put these two any higher simply because their relationship is only featured in the movie and not the Netflix show nor even the books, but we still wanted to give them a shout out. After that, we're going to rank one of the OG DreamWorks couples, Donkey and Dragon. Honestly, who doesn't love Donkey and Dragon? As strange as these two are, with their offspring being especially freakish, they just work extremely well together. Though he was scared of her at first, I mean she's a dragon, Donkey does genuinely love Dragon, seeing her beauty and the person she is underneath all the scales and sharp teeth. Dragon, meanwhile, can be very protective and is always there to help Donkey and their friends defeat the bad guys. These two are totally perfect, however. We can't forget how uh, forceful Dragon was in the first movie. That definitely didn't give her the best first impression, though we're thankful that she toned it down after Donkey escaped. On Donkey's side of things, he did briefly ditch Dragon in the second movie because she was being all moody, likely because she was pregnant with their babies. I don't know, she's been all moody and stuff lately. But then again, Donkey was more than happy to see her again and thrilled to be a dad, so we won't take too many points off for it. Next is our first Aardman couple, Rita and Roddy. Yet another opposites attract sort of couple, just with less arguing, thankfully. While Roddy was definitely a jerk at first, seeing Rita as just a thief, while Rita saw him as spoiled and snobby, usually getting exasperated with his cluelessness. During their adventures in the sewers, however, they start to appreciate the more positive aspects of each other. Rita grows to see how emotionally supportive Roddy can be, while Roddy starts to admire Rita's adventurous spirit. We also have to appreciate a couple that's able to protect and help each other instead of one person doing all the saving while the other is always the one in trouble. Oh yeah, and everything else has been a piece of cake. Rita also shows how caring she can be when she learns the truth about Roddy's home life, being concerned for his well-being instead of looking down on him for being a pet. Seeing their relationship develop throughout the film really does make their happy ending all the more satisfying. Finishing off the healthy, we have Shrek and Fiona. While many may see this couple as THE DreamWorks couple, being one of the first as well as one that has received a ton of development over the series, we feel that it's far from perfect. Simply put, these two argue a lot. They can sometimes be disrespectful towards each other, with Shrek especially having moments when he can be rude or aggressive. We are not going, and that's final. Some of his worst moments were when he told Fiona that he wasn't going to change for her in the second movie, and when he said that he missed how things were before he rescued her in the fourth movie. Ouch! Though, to be fair, Fiona can also be pretty judgmental towards Shrek's more ogre-ish tendencies, not always remembering just how isolated the guy was before he met her and their friends. Additionally, these two can sometimes struggle with communication. So, with all these faults, why are they making it into the healthy tier, even if just barely? Well, for as many not-so-great moments as they have, they have just as many great moments and grand gestures of love. They'll fight for and even sacrifice for each other, showing their love in some pretty great ways. For as much as they argue or have friction between each other, there really is no denying how much they love and care for each other, with Shrek even being willing to die for Fiona in the fourth film. Maybe they ironically don't have a fairy tale romance, but we feel they have just enough to stay out of the gray. Speaking of which, we're now going to move on to the couples that could use some work when it comes to their relationships. These are the gray couples. Starting off this tier is Puss in Boots and Kitty Soft Paws. With Puss in Boots' sequel, The Last Wish, being delayed until December 2022, we can't say for sure how their relationship will develop in that movie, but based on the first film at least, 
we still feel there's a lot to like even with Kitty's brief betrayal. Spoiler alert, couples where one partner lies is definitely going to be a running theme with these next few pairs. Now much like Wolf and Diane, there's a ton of flirting and playfulness between these two, with their personalities just clicking almost immediately. They match each other's mischievousness, and although Kitty does secretly work with Humpty Dumpty behind Puss's back, it doesn't take very long for her to break him out of jail and help him save the day. They do technically have a bit of a rivalry, but it's pretty obvious that they're both getting a lot of fun out of it too. Honestly, if it weren't for Kitty lying to and briefly betraying Puss, nearly causing him to spend the rest of his life in jail, they would have easily been in the good tier. Mr. Brisky two times. Out of all of our liar couples, these two definitely come out looking the best. Next up is another How to Train Your Dragon pair, Stoic and Valka. Let's just get this out of the way first. The main thing that puts these two this far down is, unsurprisingly, the big lie that briefly broke them up. For those not in the know, these two had very differing opinions on dragons, with Valka seeing them as gentle creatures that meant no harm, and Stoic seeing them as beastly monsters. Wanting to be with the dragons, Valka essentially ends up faking her own death by running away with them, leaving Stoic heartbroken. I pleaded so many times to stop the fighting. That's a pretty messed up thing to do to your spouse, not to mention the whole abandoning your child thing. However, this lie doesn't stop their love from blooming once again when they are reunited in the second movie. There's a ton of passion between these two, whether they're dancing together or fighting side by side. To her credit, even if Stoic wasn't angry at her for it, Valka still regretted leaving him in Hiccup behind. And though it takes a bit for her to stop holding herself back, her love for her husband is clear. As for Stoic, he accepts his wife, faults and all. Maybe there's something to be said about not holding your spouse accountable for what is a pretty messed up thing, but Stoic's dedication to his wife and the strong love he has for her is still admirable. Keeping with the liars, next up is Ginger and Rocky. These two start off with some pretty heavily clashing personalities, leading to quite a bit of friction and name calling between them. We don't really blame Rocky for lying about whether or not he could fly, given how Ginger wasn't giving him much of a choice in the matter, as well as how afraid Rocky was of returning to the circus. Still, it was pretty messed up of him to get their hopes up. We also can't ignore just how much squabbling these two do. Eventually, though, Rocky grows to understand how much Ginger cares for the other chickens and, in turn, helps them have fun, which Ginger ends up appreciating. Additionally, Rocky protects and saves Ginger's life multiple times during the film, with Ginger even returning the favor a couple of times. Like with Puss and Kitty, these two also have a sequel coming up and we're looking forward to hopefully seeing some more wholesome and romantic moments between them. Moving into the lower half of our list, we have Megamind and Roxanne Ricci. Like with Stoic and Valka, it should be pretty clear why they're this far down. Because of Megamind's dishonesty, a lot of their relationship was essentially built on a lie. Although Megamind did a lot to try and make Roxanne happy, he was still perfectly okay with continuing to lie to her and probably would have if not for Roxanne accidentally deactivating his Bernard disguise. Seeing the truth causes a lot of emotional pain and distress for Roxanne, and we can't overlook that. Do you really think that I would ever be with you? But for what it's worth, Megamind does ultimately accept her rejection, showing that he's not as entitled as someone like Hal and instead respects her as her own person even if he does still describe being with her as getting the girl. Still kind of an iffy thing to say. Roxanne's side of things also boosts their rating a bit, as she does end up supporting Megamind quite a bit in the third act of the film. She encourages him to keep trying and fighting, showing the city that he is their hero, not Metro Man, and helps him during the final fight. What's more, Roxanne holds Megamind accountable for his mistakes and evil deeds. We can appreciate a person who doesn't enable their partner's worst tendencies. While this couple has a lot of issues, especially on Megamind's side of things, there's a lot of growth and development there too, which is why they manage to stay above the toxic tier. At the end of the great tier is where we find Sherman and Penny from the Mr. Peabody and Sherman movie. There are quite a few people out there who are made uncomfortable by this pairing, and admittedly, it's not hard to see why. Penny was terrible to Sherman at the beginning of the film, bullying him and even putting him in a headlock at one point. Definitely a concerning scene. Things don't get too much better when Peabody invites Penny and her family over for dinner. Penny encourages Sherman to break the rules, having him take her for a joyride in the way back, and essentially starting the whole time travel conflict within the film. Thankfully, Penny's behavior does improve a bit as the film goes on, making their friendship and Sherman's admittedly out of nowhere crush on her a bit easier to swallow. Penny stands up for him against Mrs. Grunion and even encourages Sherman to believe in himself instead of always following Mr. Peabody's lead. 
On Sherman's side of things, he's protective of her whenever she gets herself in danger, but he also shows a bit of his jealous side when Penny briefly decides to marry a young King Tut. King Tut is your boyfriend? So, yeah, this couple has a lot of issues, most of which stem from their immaturity. In that sense, we can only hope that their relationship continues to improve as they get older. Finally, we have the couples who maybe shouldn't have gotten together at all. These are the toxic couples. We only have a few ones here, though. Getting the bronze medal of toxicity is the old farm couple, Mr. and Mrs. Tweety. While not the main couple of Chicken Run acting more as the big bads than as a romantic subplot, their relationship still gets quite a bit of screen time throughout the film. Mrs. Tweety is a pretty awful person to people and animals in general, and her husband is no exception to this. She's constantly insulting him and rolling her eyes at him whenever he claims that their chickens are intelligent, telling him that it's all in his head. Mrs. Tweety certainly also isn't afraid to get physical to make a point, whether it's hitting Mr. Tweety with a magazine or kicking him in the butt when he screws up their pie machine. As for Mr. Tweety, while he doesn't do anything to fight back against his wife, he doesn't seem to care too much about her either. When she's caught up in their machine's gravy explosion and seemingly killed, or at the very least seriously injured, Mr. Tweety barely reacts to it. If anything, these two are more like business partners than a married couple, and some pretty dysfunctional partners at that. The silver medal of toxicity is going to Susan, aka Ginormica, and Derek. Even during their happy, engaged couple montage at the beginning of the film, cracks in their relationship were already starting to show. I mean, who just cancels honeymoon plans for the sake of a job interview without telling their partner? Making this worse is how Susan just takes it, holding back her own feelings of disappointment instead of being honest, wanting to be supportive of her husband to be. Yes, it's good to be supportive of your spouse's dreams, but there's a difference between being supportive and being a doormat. Unfortunately for her, Derek doesn't give this support back in return when Susan becomes Ginormica. He hardly cares at all about her feelings, instead focusing on how her issues affect him and his career. While we can understand Derek's perspective, he dumps Susan in such a callous way that it's hard to really sympathize with him. Not helping is the fact that he never really apologizes to Susan for his behavior, instead expecting her to apologize to him. I want you to know, I forgive you. Yeah, he more than deserved that bit of humiliation at the end of the film. Still, we have to give Susan credit for realizing that she deserved better, as that is more than we can say about either of the people in the last pair on our list. Finally, we're giving the gold medal of toxicity to Shark Tales, Oscar, and Angie. Truly a couple that never should have gotten together, no matter how happy the ending of their film might be. Oscar is a huge liar and completely oblivious, both when it comes to Angie's attraction to him and his own ridiculous schemes. Angie, meanwhile, is a total enabler, even worse than Susan. Though she may call Oscar out for his lies, she doesn't do much to actually stop him from lying. And instead of communicating her feelings, Angie mostly just yells at him. You borrowed 5,000 clams from Mr. Sykes? Not that we can really blame her, given how frustrating Oscar can be, but still. Now, Oscar is arguably the worst person in this relationship, though, as while he can be apologetic at times and even tries to pay Angie back for the pink pearls she gave him, his arrogance and recklessness are pretty appalling. Even when Angie's life is in danger during the climax, Oscar still screws around. He has this big grand reveal moment at the end of the film, but it's hardly much of an apology. Yet Angie just takes him back anyway. All in all, these two are just a mess, and while there's no physical abuse and they still genuinely care about each other, we still felt that they were the most toxic DreamWorks couple. But let us know in the comments section if you agree with our ranking and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But more importantly, stay wicked.